Well, good evening. This is Pastor Jack Hollis, and uh, we are delighted you're here at Germantown Christian Center. Love to see you in person. If you're in the area, why don't you come on out and see us? Uh, you know, one thing about, about God, he loves to spend time with his family, and you know what? So do we. So we welcome you here. I'm glad you're able to spend time with us online, and you just want to have a great evening, a great devotion tonight. If you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn over to Hebrews chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. What we're going to be ministering on tonight is something, just a question to ask you. And that is this, how do you know if you're really in faith? How do you know if you're really believing God? You know, we all hear this expression, and maybe you've heard it too, you know, keep the faith. You know, keep believing, you know, don't give up. And I, and I agree, those are great sentiments to have. But really, you know, am I really in faith? Am I believing God? How do I know that I'm not, not going to be giving up? How do I know that I'm doing it correctly? Because all of us have been there where we pray and we haven't seen anything move yet. You know, you're waiting for God to show up. You're waiting for that miracle to happen. You're waiting for the answer to be given. You're waiting for the wisdom to come. I mean, you know, when we say in the name of Jesus, amen, then you're looking around. And the Bible does say watch and pray. So, you know, you look around, watch. I mean, I'm waiting for God to show up. I mean, behold and see the salvation of the Lord. I mean, you are looking around for God to show up and do something. And and you and I, I mean, we, we read our Bibles, we see in the Gospels, Jesus prayed and had an expectation that circumstances have changed. And I say have changed, in other words, past tense. He believed that when you spoke it, when you believed it, it was done. And of course, he was rather amused at the fact that some folks thought that, what, you're surprised by this? Remember the, the story of the fig tree that was being withered. He cursed it. And of course, some days later, they came back and said, Jesus, you remember that tree over there that you, we're, this amazing. I mean, they were just surprised. And Jesus was like, uh, yeah, that's how this works. You see, he was used to the supernatural. He was used to walking and living in faith. His disciples really weren't. I mean, they've seen it, but they never really appropriated it for themselves. And there's a difference. You can live around people of faith and that, and be blessed by it, but really not be changed by it and, and so many times what happens is we have people who are blessed by people of faith but not really changed by people of faith and that's why some folks follow jesus they were there for the show the miracles they were amused and amazed and surprised and marveled but but jesus said why you marveled at such things he didn't want them to marvel and and say wow that's really cool he wanted them to become a participant become involved and do it themselves I mean, the reason why John 14 is in the Bible is because John 14 is in the Bible, okay? It's important to recognize that Jesus was encouraging us that, you know, the same things that we see Jesus do, we could do ourselves, and even greater things. That's always been the heart of God. He wants us to be able to do the things that Jesus taught us. In other words, the miracles of Jesus are repeatable miracles. So that's why we should get encouragement that when you see something in the Word, you think, well, that's kind of what I need. Praise God. Guess what? God will do it again because he's not a respecter of persons. In other words, he doesn't play favorites. So here in Hebrews chapter 4, beginning of verse 1, it says this, Let us therefore fear. Now, I have to stop because some folks will look at this and say, Well, oh, we're... God doesn't want you to be afraid, but he wants you to have a reverence, a fear of solemnity, a respect. We ought to have a respect for God, shouldn't we? I mean, so, but yet that word that's there is, we, we have a fear. We have a wholesome understanding of the awesomeness of God. All of us should have that, uh, but it's cultivated. Nobody really wakes up with a real reverence of God. It's something that is, is learned, it is taught, it is disciplined in. It's kind of like kids. You know, you, you have kids, and, and as, as you see them grow from an infant up there, they have certain traits. Some of those traits are not great traits. And so you've got to kind of work them out. Because if you don't, then they become really really good at those bad traits okay and so you've got to train them and so we need to train ourselves to respond favorably godly to stimuli to circumstances and that's part of the process of renewing our minds how do we handle stuff when it happens to us do we freak out do we yell do we scream do we profane do we just give up do we blame others i mean how, how do we respond when things don't go our way well, if you're in faith, your response is different than when you're not in faith. Because faith governs your actions. Faith governs your thoughts. Faith governs your words. Faith governs you. Okay, we all know that, but 
So we're supposed to have a reverential fear, a respect of God. It says we need to take discipline, be obedient, be, be careful in these things, be attentive. Otherwise, it says, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of us should come short of it. What he's saying is we need to be very careful, have a reverential respect for God, an understanding of the solemnity involved, so that we don't even have one promise God left us that we don't get to receive and enter into the rest that comes because we are believing God. I look at that verse and I say it tells me at least that there are some ancillary benefits to, to being in faith. One of those benefits is you're at rest. You ever heard the expression rest in peace? Rip. That's always usually the connotation is well when you die and your body's dead then they put rest in peace on your tombstone. Well, the only time you realize that you should be at peace is not when you die. Okay? You know, your body is at rest, meaning it's there's no life in it. There's no schism. There's no, I mean, you're just at rest. We need to be peaceful at rest, no matter the circumstance of our life. And we can if we know we have gotten God working on our behalf. Make sense? If you know you got a bill that's coming due, and let's say the bill is $100, if you know you've got more than $100, you're not really worried about the bill, are you? You're like, I would just pay it. If you got 25 cents, you got a $100 bill, then you got an issue, don't you? One of the, one of the more humorous quotes or expressions I remember, Lee Trevino is a famous golfer of the past. They called him the happy, you know, the happy Mexican and all that. He was a great golfer back many, many years ago. And, and I remember um, he was, uh, he was uh, a young man in his teens. And there was a guy by the name of Sam Sneed. And he was a prolific golfer, much older. I mean, he could have been his dad or grandfather even at this time. And some of us kept telling, hey, there's, a, there's this Mexican kid from Texas, that really good golfer. And so, you know, they would go around and he would, Sam had a thing that he would have games and he would gamble with folks on, you know, games. So he, they, they went to where this, 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 this teenager was and they said, well, it, and, they, and they bet on, the, on a match that who's going to win straight up. So they bet it was like $100. That's a lot of money, especially back in that day. And so they said, okay, $100. I said, okay. So they went out and played, and Sam said he was a professional golfer. This teenager was just a teenager, but he was really good. It turns out, Lee Trevino won. So Sam Steve couldn't believe it. He was, man, they said you were good. I didn't realize you were that good. He said, man, you're going to have a great career if you get you know, at this game. Well, he did too, you know. So Sam's reaching into the pocket and pulls out a $100 bill and, is ready to, and, and, and gave it to Lee. And he said, wait just a minute. Let me ask you a question. Do you even have $100? He says, I do now. <laughs> the man, Lee Jovina says, I didn't, have a, I didn't have $2 in my pocket. But he said, I knew I was going to win that. He knew that he, but he says, you don't know what pressure is until you've been playing for $100 and you don't have but a dollar. But he said, I was totally at peace, had no, I mean, he just, he just was in peace. He knew he had this. That, to me, in a natural way, kind of reveals where you are with faith. You just know you've got this. There is just a confidence, not an arrogance, but an assuredness, a confidence that says, we got this. We meaning you and God. Make sense? And so here it goes on to say this, that we should not even let one promise of entering into that type of rest that you come short of it. And here's the thing about it, too. Everybody wants peace, don't we? How many of you like to be able to, you know, you, you have your castle wherever you live. You want to have peace. The drawbridge comes up. The moat is out there. You got it fully stacked with alligators, right? Crocodiles. And so this is your safe area. This is your zone. This is where you are. You, you get home and you take your shoes off and maybe you put on your ratty pajamas or whatever you put on there. You just, you don't have to wear it, but you know, you know, no one's looking at you. You can be yourself. You know, you got your fuzzy pajamas, fuzzy shoes on, whatever you got, wherever it is, you are comfortable. You're not expecting anyone to come knocking at your door and you're not letting them in. I mean, you are, you're in for the night. Okay. You're at rest. You're at peace. You are in the safety of your home. Well, the thing that gets me is that the Bible says here that we need to be in that type of place spiritually. That we're adept, we're familiar, we are comfortable 
in the midst of, you know, of, of, of where we are. Because we know we're in the heart of God. We're right there in the center of his hand. We have a peace that says, God's got me covered. No matter where that happens to be. Moat and everything is wherever you are. You're just good. But I look at this verse and it, it speaks something to me. It speaks to me that the only way I'm going to have rest is if I'm in faith. And if I'm in faith, I can have rest. A lot of times we kind of fail to realize that, that we can't have rest unless we're in faith. And if you don't have, if you're not resting, if you're not competent, if you don't have that assurance, then look around and say, what is it that I'm not in faith about that's causing me this type of distress? Because faith will lead you into peace. Okay. Verse 2 says this, And for unto us the gospel was preached. What does the gospel mean? We, we, what is the expression we say when we hear gospel? What is it that we most times in English, what do we say the gospel is? It's what? Good news. So we all like good news, don't you? I mean, listen, we, we play Monopoly. How many of you know when you look at Community Chest and it says, Good news! You get like tax refund in your favor and you're like, oh, I get $15, you know, I mean, good news. Okay. Well, this is good news. You know, the bad news is go to jail. Do not pass. Go do not collect $200. That's bad news. Well, this is good news. And so it says for unto us, good news was preached. See, God preaches to you the good news because it's good stuff to hear. It's something you need to relish, something you need to enjoy. You need to ta attach yourself to that good news because if you're not listening and hearing good news, then you're really not in a position to be able to say, I can be at peace and be at rest. You're probably not at that place. You've got to have the constant hearing of the good news, the gospel. What does God say about things to offset, to counterbalance the stuff the world's trying to put in your mind and before your eyes and into your life, into your lap, so to say. It says, for unto us the gospel was preached as unto everybody else, but the word preached did not profit those that, you know, heard, but... You know, it did profit them because it did not get mixed with faith. And it says, it did not get mixed with faith in them that heard it. See, the thing about it is, the word of God that you hear does not automatically mean you're walking in faith. There's a lot of people can read the Bible, but it doesn't mean they're getting faith out of it. Remember how you preach? I've, I've had some people that read the Bible as if they're reading a newspaper, like a textbook. That, that's that's really you know that that's not the way the Bible is to be read. You can learn from it, meditate the Scripture, but you realize this is the living, breathing Word of God. This is life. This is actually God Himself speaking into your life. And so here it says that you don't get profited by the Word unless you mix it with faith. Do you know where your mixing bowl is? What's your mixing bowl? Yeah, your mouth. People, what they do is, you can hear the word. You can even meditate the word. But it becomes alive, it gets mixed up, it becomes incorporated in you as you speak it out loud. You remember over there in Romans chapter 10? I love Romans 10, don't you? Okay, how many of you are glad you're going to heaven and not hell? Okay, I'm glad I'm going to heaven and not hell, okay? And uh, it reminds us there that there's a power to confession. Saying something with your mouth, isn't that right? With the heart man believes unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation, right? Ask yourself, well, what? it means I'm mixing the word with faith and the mixing bowl is in my mouth. You ought to be affirming what the word says. And see, a lot of times what happens is you ascend to it mentally, but that doesn't mean it helps you spiritually. How many times have you said, well, I, I know that, but you didn't do anything with it? Oh, I've heard that. Listen, I mean, let's just be honest. We've all, it doesn't matter if you're a pastor or anybody, all, we're all Christians, okay? How many times have you ever sat there and heard somebody preach to you and you thought, oh, I've heard this message? I'll just be honest with you. Come on now. I've sat, listen, I've, I've sat down and I've heard some, I mean, I've heard things. And listen, I know 
you know, I mean, I am who I am. I, I'm, I'm trying to let God make me into what he wants me to become. I know I'm not the best teacher, the best pastor, the best anything. We, hey, we're all on a, on a scale. We just need to be the best us that God wants us to be. But I've sat down, I'll be honest with you, I've sat in services before in meetings, and I'm thinking, dear Lord Jesus, I can preach this message better than this guy is. Stumbling over words, not even using examples, everything else. And all of a sudden, I mean, I could, and then the Lord will check me up and says, oh, I guess you mean you're not teachable, huh? You see, we ought to be able to learn at everything, at every occasion, every opportunity, and you can if you make an investment and a decision to do that. So what happens is sometimes you, you hear, you may, drop, God will drop something down inside of you. If you're just stay willing, stay teachable, let God speak to you. Because remember, he, he does not try to impress you. He's trying to help you. What I get distressed by is I see too many preachers and teachers trying to impress people with their teaching and their preaching. Instead of trying to help people. Know your audience. Know where people are. You know, the idea is it shouldn't be lift yourself up and let people be drawn unto Jesus. No, it's lift Jesus up and let people be drawn unto God. Be careful who you're lifting up. Make sense? And so here we need to make sure we're lifting up the word. But do it for yourself. Lift up the word in your life. Meditate that word. But give it life. Give it life. There's times I've sat down, remember, the Lord dropped something in me, and I'll say, oh, man, that's good. But then he'll remind me, don't forget it. When God drops something down in your heart, write it down. Become incorporated in your life, but then start announcing it. Start, start confessing it, saying it, affirming it. People say, well, you mean, is this part of this, you know, you know confession thing? And, and uh, Yeah, well, you say what you want to, but God, God instituted it. All you have to do is if you, like, if you go back to the book of Genesis. And God said, let there be light. And God said, and God said, and there was. He's teaching us. He's showing us. Jesus said, I mean, you know, you go back to Mark 11, you know, you know, you know, 22, 23, and 24. You know, say into the mountain to be that removed and cast into the sea. I mean, he's telling us, he's encouraging us. Oh, look at that fig tree you cursed. When Jesus spoke and said, Lazarus, come forth. See, what I'm saying is there's, there's that power of what you said. You, you literally took the word and put it in the mixing bowl of your mouth and mixed it with faith and spoke it out of your spirit. And look what happened. See, the problem is a lot of us are not doing it for God's purposes, but sometimes we just say things we shouldn't be saying. And we're mixing it with faith, but it's not the God kind of faith. Be honest. Have you ever heard people say things out of your mouth that you thought, oh, man, why are you saying that? And they believe it. I've had people, I, I remember some time ago, one, one, I had it happen on many occasions, but one particular, I had somebody tell me, yeah, and I start talking to them, and, and uh, you know, they start talking, say, yeah, and I said, well, you're doing okay? Yeah, I feel, feel okay, but hey, I only got a couple more years to live. I said, what do you mean? Well, my grandfather died at, you know, 55, and my father died at 56, so I guess I'll be dead by 55 or 56 myself. He's mixing something in that bowl of his that I don't know why you'd ever want to eat. Right? So you got to ask yourself, are you really wanting to eat what you're mixing? Anybody like, be honest, raw cookie dough? Chocolate chip raw cookie dough. Anybody like that? People say, you shouldn't be eating raw cookie dough. It's, you know, well, okay, whatever. You know, use pasteurized eggs are good. And um, you, know, so you mix some, you know, the, the Toll House cookies. You know, you got the chocolate chips and you got some good cream butter. Use the cultured butter. Really, little trick here. Use cultured butter. It makes your cookies a little bit better. And then you, you put all that stuff in there with fresh vanilla. Not the stuff you buy, not the cheap stuff. I mean, real fresh vanilla. Okay? And it just really gives it a real pop and a good, it's great. And cookies are wonderful, but you know, who can resist sitting in a mixing bowl and raw, as it were, and just dip it out a little bit out and thinking, mm, well, that's good. You know, people say, well, you'll have worms growing in your stomach. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> I didn't put worms in it. I'm not getting worms out of it, okay? And so you, you, you take that, you think, well, that's really good. And, and there's nothing wrong with it. It's, it's, not, it's not been cooked yet, but the ingredients are still tasting good. 
For a lot of us, we hear the word and it's good. And maybe it hasn't fully manifested yet. And we're, we're confessing it and we're not really, you know, we're, we're believing God. And maybe we're saying, you know, I, I can see that. And I'm, I'm trying to get to that place and I'm not maybe, maybe there yet, but I'm getting closer. It doesn't mean that the dough isn't still good. Still, still eat the dough. The dough, you still eat the dough while the cookies are in the oven. Don't you? I, well, I do. Eat that dough a little bit while the cookies and you're watching them and sit there for 12, 13 minutes and you're like, okay, looks good, okay. Well, while you're believing God, make sure you got still that mixing bowl that you have. You know, eat from it. Father, I thank you. Your word is true. Your mercy endureth forever. You are a truth teller. If you spoke it, it comes to pass. If you tell me to speak it, you bring it to pass. You use that while it's in the oven. While you're getting firmly fixed in faith, while you're seeing to it that you're trying not to let a promise of entering into that rest that's going to be escaping you, you're making sure you use it. And what I do is I'll scrape every bit of that out of that mixing bowl. Or if I'm making creme brulee, I'll make sure I scrape every bit out of that out of the stainless steel thing to make sure I get all of it out because you don't want any of it to go to waste. Make sure you exhaust everything that God's put inside of your spirit and you're mixing up in your little mixing bowl of your mouth. See, the question is, am I in faith? That is a question we need to constantly be asking ourselves. And I can say right now, you can see if you're in faith by looking at your actions and by looking what comes out of your mouth. You can locate yourself just by what's coming out of your mouth. Just affirm in your own life what God says about you. God looks at you and says, blessed, lovely, beloved. Yet I hear people talk bad about themselves all the time. It's amazing the stuff that Christians say about themselves. Folks, if you walk up to a painting and think, man, that looks like, that's bad. That looks like trash. And if the artist is sitting over there listening to this, what are you just doing? You're denigrating him. him. You're, you're denigrating what he's done. You're denigrating his talents and abilities, aren't you? If you talk bad about yourself, or anyone else, you're created in the image and likeness of God. You're saying things about the artist. You have no right to do that. I said, you have no right to do that. See, a lot of times what happens is we don't see what's underneath the canvas or what we're just still in, we're still in a place of completion. If you walked up to Michelangelo and I'm sure looked at some of the drawing, oh, that doesn't look like much. Just give them time. There's some, you know, I mean, just be honest with you. There's, there's a Sistine Chapel that if you ever looked up and seen it, like, wow, that's pretty incredible. Yeah. I think a guy did that laying on his back. That's amazing. What I'm saying is, he who hath begun a good work, trust him, and he's going to finish it until the return of Jesus Christ. Do it in your life. Amen? So, again, mix things with faith. Use the mixing bowl of your mouth. So when you hear the word, sit there every time you hear a preacher. Even if he's not very good, even if it's me. You know? Sit there and say, God, I want you to speak to me. You know? Despite whoever it is, I want to hear from you. I want your Holy Spirit to bring to life something that's being said so it becomes real in my life. So that I can take that and do something good for you and enter into a rest. Be at peace and to give you the glory for it. Amen. Well, did you get something out of this devotion tonight? Okay, praise God. Well, I hope you did too as well. Those of you joining us online, thank you for your time. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'm just, I, I believe with you. I, I know God's got a plan for all of us. Not just one, but all of us. And so it's to that end that we live our lives every day. When we get up, we say, Father, here I am. Please use me. We want God to have fun with us because it's a lot of fun to be used by the Most High God to let Jesus, you know, just play with us. Have fun with us every day. Do what he says. Be a blessing to others. It's a joy indeed. Well, if you want to be a blessing to this church uh, with your financial giving, I say thanks again for everything you guys are doing. 
Uh, that information is on the screen. If you would need something, something we can do for you, reach out to us. That information is on the screen as well. We're going to be here on uh, Sunday morning at 9.30 and 10.30 Central Time. We'd love to see you in person. We'll also be here online about 10.40, 10.45 Central Time on Sunday. Uh, but again, we'd love to see you in person if you're available to do that. Until that time, we just wish you the very best and pray that God will continue to show himself faithful in your behalf because that's just who he is. He's a faithful God. Have a blessed evening and never forget it, but Jesus is Lord. Bye-bye now.